So anybody that isn't born in this country always has to ask for permission to be here in the United States. There are many, many different ways that they can ask for permission to be here. But the ones that are people are most familiar with are coming as tourists with a B1, B2 visa, um, or they can enter as students uh, with an F1 visa. With a J1 visa, that's for like cultural exchange programs that allow you to stay for a smaller amount of time and study. There are visas for vocational people that want to study a trade while they're in the United States. Um, there are also visas for people that are seeking employment in the United States, which are very difficult to obtain. In some cases, if people have immediate family relatives that are residents or citizens in the United States, it may be possible for them to ask for permission to live here um, after their family members have succeeded in petitioning for them if they're eligible. And most employment-based visas require a great deal of education or a high level of expertise in a trade or profession, our extraordinary talent in a particular area of entertainment um, or in sports. Um, so it's very rare for people to get those types of permissions to enter the United States. Um, I think in most cases, especially in the Southwest region, people have learned that getting a tourist visa is probably the easiest option if you have the means to do so. Um, but even that can be very difficult for most people because you have to be able to show that you have sufficient ties to your own country and the means to justify your trip to visit. So I can't speak about other foreign countries' immigration laws, but I can tell you that in this country, you always have to be honest. And if it's your intent to use a tourist visa to subsequently become something else, um, an immigrant visa, for example, that you're intending to abuse the tourist visa process so that you can gain access, and subsequently become a resident by marrying a spouse, and you knew that from the beginning, that can be a reason for them to deny your admission or your applications in the future. So that's any person that entered the United States and never was inspected and admitted at a port of entry, which could be a bridge, or it could be a seaport, or it could be an airport. But if you didn't enter the way that we authorize you into the United States, then you are an undocumented person. So a path to citizenship is a very generic term that tries to describe several very complicated processes. Um, and the answer to your question is sometimes and it depends, which is the answer to most legal questions. Um, but in certain circumstances, depending on why the person is seeking some type of permission to remain in the United States, it may be possible for them to get permission to stay here even if they entered without permission. So the definition of a refugee is defined in the Immigration Code, um, and that's not the type of term you would use for a person that's already here in the United States. Instead, um, and this is sometimes common, people that are seeking asylum in the United States may need to meet the definition of a refugee in order to be eligible to apply for asylum. Um, but that's a very difficult, expensive, and complicated process um, that uses a body of laws that's over 60 years old and doesn't accurately define areas of protection that most people are fleeing in this modern century. As an attorney, I should always encourage people to follow the law, um, but it's not that easy. Almost everybody that enters the United States at a port of entry and requests protection for asylum will likely be detained, especially under this administration. And uh, those decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis by the immigration officials, um, and they sometimes make exceptions for certain types of family groups in, in the manner in which they arrive at the bridge seeking asylum. But it's very common to see immigration separate families at the bridge, even if they're married, um, and they have children, and they'll send perhaps the mother with the minor child, and they'll detain the father, or they'll detain the uh, children that they have that are over the age of 18 and separate them from the rest of the family group. It's a very difficult process. The children are detained like adults, and immigration detention centers made just for children where only children are housed. Um, they still have to go to immigration court. They still have to see an immigration judge. They still have the responsibility of retaining counsel on their own. Um, the government does not provide them with an attorney if they can't afford one. Um, the immigration judges do the best that they can to help the child, and sometimes if they have a representative, get through the process so they can reunify them with their family, but it is not a system that is designed to um, encourage children to be able to litigate on their own and to feel that there are safeguards in place to ensure that they don't fall between the cracks and are returned home. So DACA is a program that was created by President Obama called the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program. And what DACA is, is it's a constitutional use of prosecutorial discretion. So 
Um, the way that people can best understand what prosecutorial discretion is, is that it's the law enforcement officer's power to decide when to enforce um, a law. So if you've ever been pulled over by a police officer and you were hoping for the best that he give you a warning as opposed to a ticket, then you are relying on his power to decide, his to not give you a ticket and to instead um, give you an opportunity to avoid having to be a part of the criminal justice or the traffic process. Similarly, the President of the United States is the Chief Law Enforcement Officer for the United States. And so in that capacity, he was able to explain that his power to decide which cases are a priority for prosecution and which ones aren't for immigration purposes falls squarely within his constitutional authority within the executive branch to decide where the limited use of resources should be directed. And um, he created a program where people could affirmatively request protection from deportation after they had been thoroughly vetted by his administration. And um, that's what DACA is. So it gave them two year protection from deportation and also work authorization after they'd been vetted through the executive departments of Homeland Security's office. So President Trump, because it's not a law, it's not a regulation, it's a policy that talks about when and how or whether to exercise prosecutorial discretion, uh, didn't require any formal process for ending. And so the president uh, that we currently have has ended that program. It requires Congress to pass a law that allows certain people under whatever circumstances they define to have a pathway to residency and then subsequently citizenship. Um, there is no way to become a resident if you were granted protection from deportation through DACA. And what advocates are asking for at this time is that because we know the program works, because we know that the vetting process was very successful and that people were willing to disclose their information um, and that they were willing to pay for that benefit, um, that it should be a policy that Congress can turn into a legal uh, means for giving people some kind of legal status in the United States. And if they so choose to make it a pathway to residency, but no law such as that exists at this time that's ever been passed. Everybody pays when they ask for any type of immigration benefit, be it a work authorization permit for a very sophisticated work employment permission, or whether it be for somebody that's asking for um, permission to be here through a relative, like with residency or some other immigration benefit where we charge fees for them to submit their application. It's more than just the fees that people pay, um, which can be approximately $365 for the application fee before they do biometrics. Um, but the benefit of being able to have people step forward and have authorization to work um, is an enormous um, amount of money that we will lose because it's a workforce that can be taxed and that is taxed um, when they receive their work authorization permit. I guarantee you almost all of them have been paying taxes because they can't work without the work authorization card. And many people that have DACA um, are very happy to uh, let the federal income, um, the IRS know that they're working and they can file their income taxes every year. Like around 1986, 85, during the Reagan administration, there was an amnesty and there were a lot of people that live here in the United States that benefited from that and that allowed them to apply for residency, even though they had entered the United States without permission if they could meet certain criteria regarding physical presence and their criminal history, if there was any. Um, in 2000 to 2001, there was a different type of uh, adjustment to the immigration code that was called um, I adjustment of status under INA section 245I, um, which gave people permission to remain in the United States if they paid a fee um, and had a relative that could allow them to petition for them um, without having to leave the country in order to become a resident, which is normally the rule, that if you enter the country without permission, you are not allowed to physically remain in the United States and apply for adjustment of status, which allows you to become a resident without leaving. Instead, you have to go through an American consulate, and that process can separate families anywhere between six months to several years, which at the time, they were really far behind. And it seemed like a humane remedy to keep families together. Um, that option is still available as long as you filed that application before 2001 in April. Um, but if you had a petition that was filed for you after that date in 2001, um, you're no longer eligible to apply for permission to become a resident without leaving 
President Obama tried to um, make that process a little more hu humane while he was in office and allowed for a waiver called an I-601A waiver for unlawful presence, which would allow people to apply for residency um, without having to leave the country right away until the day of their interview where they'd have to go to their home country and complete the process outside the United States. Um, but those are areas of opportunity that Congress can revisit to continue to try to make the immigration process more humane than unrealistic. So I think there are a lot of law enforcement communities that will tell you that it's, their job is easier to secure communities when they have people in the community that are willing to cooperate with them. Um, it's a lot harder to solve a crime when you have witnesses that don't want to cooperate because they're afraid that something might happen to themselves or unwilling to prosecute those that cause harm to themselves for fear that something uh, detrimental might happen to themselves as well. So whenever we have people on the grid, it helps everybody in law enforcement because it means that there's more stakes in the game to help solve and prevent crimes and report crimes. I think that uh, it would be really neat to amend the INA 245I law and uh, change that date so that we can have a stopgap measure to allow families to remain in the United States without being separated, that we just create a new date that allows people to say that if there's been a petition filed as soon as like this year or before, that they're eligible to pay a fee of like $1,000 like before and stay here. That would help tons of families a way that it did back in 2000 and they would be legal and they would be vetted and those applications would be considered both by immigration judges in court if they're in removal proceedings and also by USCIS if they're not. Um, I think it's time for us to do something about DACA, not make DACA the presidential program that it was in the past, but to create a program that does give people permission to remain in the United States legally. Um, I think that it would be really great if we did more to expand our protection grounds for asylum purposes so that people that are fleeing gang persecution or economic extortion, which are the two primary reasons for why people are fleeing Central America and other places in the world would have a, a better opportunity of being able to defend their cases for asylum purposes without having to go into a very sophisticated analysis that's very hard to succeed on winning on based based on particular social group analysis, which is still very undeveloped and not addressing the majority of the needs of the people that are seeking protection here. Um, I think that there is an opportunity for us to revisit how we use temporary protected status. Um, we're familiar with its usage for victims of serious uh, climate change issues, such as hurricanes or earthquakes. Um, but that law is also designed to help people that are in a situation where their countries are falling apart because of severe crime and delinquency. And if Congress considered reauthorizing TPS for Central American countries where people are literally fleeing the violence, which is a, a legitimate, sincere concern of theirs, um, it would still give people access to a pathway to citizenship, arguably by through some circuits, and also help to uh, weigh that against the concerns of some people that they'll be here indefinitely because it's a protected status that needs to be reauthorized by Congress every so many years as they see fit. We need to have a sincere conversation about our workforce. Um, there should be a conversation about having a worker visa for people that are not highly skilled laborers, right? Not just agricultural work, but that we have a domestic worker visa would solve a great deal of the immigration issues because unbeknownst to most Americans, a lot of the people that are here without permission um, actually do love their home countries and are really asking for an opportunity to earn income here and to send it home to help their families. And if there was a domestic worker type visa where people could apply to be people that work in low skill trades and they're vetted and they have an employer, whether it be an individual or a corporation, um, that I think if it were accessible, people would take advantage of that. You could set limitations on how and what types of work people could apply for, but the work would be there and everyone would benefit. And it helps the entire hemisphere because the income flows back home. And when you stabilize economies back home, it makes it easier for those governments to have access to the resources they need to make their communities safer. The security of our borders is important and the people that live along the borders know that those are major corridors for human trafficking, it's a fact and for trafficking drugs, that's a fact. Um, but the people that can afford to engage in those types of enterprises are not deterred by a physical wall. Um, and so there should have been a more informed conversation about creating a virtual wall and providing um, resources on the ground to address those needs um, as they see necessary. Um, I think that we need to do more 
to meet our obligation internationally to address the human need of taking care of people that really are fleeing persecution and what we've done as far as detaining people and then putting them in expedited processes of removal where their court cases um, are expected to be decided in less than a month or two time when it takes some criminal cases many more months in order to get the evidence they need to build their cases I think is unfair and it's terribly unrealistic when people are relying on information that are thousands of miles away and in written foreign language sometimes that are very hard to find interpreters for. So we should reframe and re-understand what it is that we need to do as far as securing the border, but a physical border um, hurts the people that we're trying to help more than it hurts the people we say we're trying to stop.